Let's talk about speciation, how one population of organisms can become two different populations of organisms, which eventually leads to two new species of organisms. And here's just some uh, pretty crazy species out there. We have the lionfish, red panda, uh, tarsier. This is a platyhelminthes, a type of sea slug. We have the barrel fish, really cool fish whose eyes are actually looking straight up. It's got a clear head. And the golden mole. Well, before we talk about how to become a new species, let's talk about what is a species. We can't define a species by looks alone. Otherwise, we would look at these two spiders here and say, whoa, those are definitely different species of spider. Or, whoa, this thing is like a third larger than the other one there. That's probably a different species there. Oh, those are definitely different species. I mean, you know, take a look at those. Whoa, definitely different species. They look nothing alike, nothing alike. Well, the problem is every single one of these is male and female, and the males just happen to look a little bit different. So if we define a species by looking similar, all of these different species here would be separate. When in reality, these two are the same, these two are the same, these two are, like, but it's, you have to go by more than looks. So let's talk about what is it. Sometimes it's really easy to distinguish between species, an elephant and a mouse. Well, clearly those are different species. Sometimes that's easy. Other times they look at insects and they're like, oh, those all look the same, but no, nope, those are three different species there. These are called lace leaves. So what is a species if it's not looks? We can't define a species by just producing offspring either. Otherwise, we would say that this one right here, the mule, is a new species, but it's not. They're sterile. A mule is the offspring of a male donkey called a jack and a female horse called a mare, but they themselves are sterile. Mules can't necessarily really have babies. What about this thing here? It looks a little bit like a buffalo, looks a little bit like a cow, but it's not. That's actually called a beefalo. It is a hybrid between domestic cattle and the American bison, but can't reproduce on their own. They're sterile. Or of course we have the most famous of all of them, the liger. The liger is a hybrid between a male lion and a female tiger. That is different than a tigon, which is the exact opposite there. But ligers are not a new species because they can't reproduce. They are sterile. So the offspring of a cross have to be fertile or it doesn't count. So here's the problem. When you have these zygotes, these fertilized eggs of two different species, the instructions from the eggs and sperm are two different. The zygote never develops into a baby. So the zygote doesn't know what to do, never develops, spontaneously aborts. So here's what a species is. A species is a population that can interbreed, they can all mate with each other, and produce fertile offspring. This is why mules, liders, and beefalo aren't new species. They can't have babies. These ones here can. Tigers can breed with each other and produce fertile tigers. Ladybugs can reproduce with each other and produce ladybugs. Ducks can reproduce with the, or the same species of ducks can reproduce, and so on and so forth. They have to be able to produce fertile offspring. And this is where you get into the concept of a gene pool. When you can mate and produce fertile offspring, we would say that you are in the same gene pool. The gene pool is kind of the sum, the total, of all of the different genetics in a population. In this population, if I was to look at it, I have a whole bunch of green genes, I have a red gene, a couple purple genes in there. That is the pool of genes that a population can draw from. Here we have uh, different boars. You can see homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, heterozygous, and essentially all these animals are mixed into mating, so a population is pulled from that gene pool. This here, of course, is the beetle, and this, of course, here is the pug, and they can mate and produce fertile offspring called the puggle. So we would say that these are the same species because they share a gene pool. Beetles and pugs can mate and produce offspring. They're in the same gene pool. They're the same species. Get it? Gene pool? Ha, ha, ha. Here's how speciation happens. You need to have what is called reproductive isolation. That's when members of two populations can't mate and produce fertile offspring. They are isolated from each other reproductively. Isolation just as simply, simply means that they are separated. And we've got a couple different ways that you can separate. One is by behavior, one is by geography, and one is by time. Here's what behavioral isolation is. This is when two species could interbreed but have different courtship rituals. That there is the western meadow arc. This is the eastern meadow arc. Now, if I was to ask you guys to classify them by looks alone, you would probably put them as the exact same species because they look almost identical. However, to each other, they are very, very different to this point. Take a look at uh, the western meadow arc, and here is what the western meadow arc sounds like. Now, let's compare that to the eastern meadow arc.
As you can tell, they have very, very different sounds. From the point of view of these birds, that is different enough to keep them separate. They don't want to have anything to do with each other. They don't want to reproduce with each other. Even though it might sound somewhat similar to us, to them, it's a world of difference. So even though they can mate and produce fertile offspring, they choose not to because they just have different behaviors. Let's compare that to another one, temporal or time isolation. Now, you don't really see this in humans. You will see this in other animals. There's a period of time when they are in heat. If they are tied to the season, some of them are really only going to be reproducing maybe one month of the, out of the year. That is when they're fertile. Now, if they're in heat, if they reproduce at different times, that may as well be separated by a continent because there's no way that they're reproducing. Some plants do this as well. Some are producing pollen in March, some are producing pollen in August. They could be right next to each other, but they may as well be separated by Antarctica because they're never going to fertilize with each other because they're not ready. So they're isolated by time. And then, of course, the one that most people understand is geography. Sometimes a river or a mountain can keep a population apart. And what this will do is separate a population into two gene pools. These are called abiotic, or non-living factors. Here I have a population of brown beetles. Now let's say a river arises, and it effectively splits the population. Let's say these beetles don't fly across. This population has now got their own thing, and they've got their own thing here. Over time, remember, natural selection is going to shape them to their own individual environment. Maybe there's more vegetation here, so the ones that are green survive and reproduce more. Maybe it's darker here, more dirt, so the ones that are darker brown have a greater chance of survival and reproduction. Now, let's say that river dries up. The genetic differences between those two, because each of them has been adapting to their own populations, will now prevent them from ever interbreeding. At this point, they are effectively a different species. You can do this in the lab with fruit flies. It's, it's amazing how quickly this happened. Now, the cool part about fruit flies is how quickly they can reproduce. Depending upon the temperature, they can reproduce anywhere from one week to two weeks. That's how long their life cycle is. So, you can do this very quickly. You take a single species of fruit fly and you just randomly separate them. And this one gets a starch-based food, this one gets a maltose-based food, just slightly different sugars, but just different food. That's the only difference between them. Eight or more generations, so we're talking maybe four or five months at most, and now they have a mating preferences. The ones that were fed only starch will only mate with ones that have been fed starch. The ones that only eat maltose have only want to mate with the ones that also eat maltose. You can literally create a new species of insect in just a couple months. It's very, very easy. And they are separated by essentially geography. Now, let's take a look at the Isthmus of Panama as a really excellent example of this. Now, here is uh, the Panama Canal, roughly. It, it uh, varies a little bit from there. But on one side of the Panama Canal, the east side or north side, depending upon who you're talking to there, we have these seven species of snapping shrimp. Snapping shrimp are really, really cool animals. I advise you to look into them. On the other side, we have seven different species. Now, where things get interesting is the fact that for each one, its closest living relative is on the other side of the Isthmus of Panama. You'd think that the closest relative would be the one that's super close. If you were to go by boat and ignore the Panama Canal, that is literally tens of thousands of miles to get from one side to the other. So why is their closest living relative in literally a different ocean as opposed to like just a couple miles away? Their gene pools were separated. The Isthmus of Panama is about 3 million years old. This implies that we had these seven species of snapping shrimp, and when the isthmus arose, it separated them into new populations. So, they no longer have the ability to breed with each other. They are now isolated. From seven species, we now have 14 different species. So here's the way it works. Speciation is the process in which one or two new species evolve from a single ancestral species. The two populations are separated from each other in some way. In this case, sort of like a mountain arose there. When this happens, each population is going to adapt to its own environment because they're going to be a little bit different. Now, they acquire so many differences that when they get together, they either can't or won't reproduce with one another. If they were to reproduce, the hybrid would not be very good. And so even if you were to get something that was kind of a hybrid, a little mix of both of them, like the ones on the west side, you know, were tall and hairless. The ones on the east side were, you know, short and furry. If you were to deal with those a combination of it, it is no longer the fittest. It does not fit in in either environment. If you put it in either environment, it would get outcompeted and die. So from the point of view of parents, that is a huge waste of energy. That was essentially wasted time on an organism that will not be able to survive and produce offspring. So to summarize speciation, 
A population has to be separated by some kind of a barrier, whether it's behavior or time or geography. Each population will then adapt and evolve to its own environment, and if you put them back together, those changes build up so that when, the or when you put them together, the organisms can't or won't produce fertile offspring with each other. I'm going to pause here so you guys can write this down. So, how new species evolve? A lot of people think it's, oh, it's this to this. To... It's not. Speciation is a slow, gradual thing. There you eventually get a split, and when they come back together, they are different species. Organisms change very slowly, very gradually over time, but a speciation event has to imply some sort of separation. Something separates them into two different populations, which is how we end up with all the diversity of life now.